you would please open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I thank the Lord for the great kindness that he has showed us thus far in our conference. I have told several that I could not have sat down and custom required the sermons uh, any better than what the Lord in his great kindness sent along with these brothers. Many of the things burning in my own heart, they have beautifully preached and with great grace, with power, and uh, I thank the Lord for this. It's fed my own soul, and I do urge all of us uh, not, not to catch the, the conference virus, uh, which we, we hear these hymns, we hear these sermons, and then we walk out without the content. We have had wonderful practical applications set before us. I won't do a show of hands, but I'm wondering how many of us awoke this morning saying, okay, today I get in motion and we'll be looking for someone to speak of Christ to. It's the first and most beautiful and simple of, of Brother Jason's message. But these are important matters and we forget easily. So let us take the blessing God is giving us, and as our brother Mala has warned, let us not turn, I guarantee, if we hear and hear the word and do not obey it. I can assure you, um, the pastor gets boring, church gets dull, and it's all their fault, not us. So may we take these things to heart and thank our God and apply these things to our souls. <clears throat> We're going to read verses 1 through 7. Would you please stand with me and let's give our attention to the Word of God. Brethren, this is the Word of our Lord. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou canst, hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. For this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray with all of my heart now. Thou hast heard our weak voices over the months. Asking thee to meet with us and to bless. And Father, thou hast raised up men to speak to us. Thou hast laid the messages that they have preached to us. Lord, thou hast indeed blessed us. 
Now, Father, help us once again as we take up thy word. I need thy help to preach. I can say, neither can I do anything that will help a soul here if thy spirit does not come. Thou art the good Father. Please grant us thy spirit. Open the eyes of the lost. Sanctify the saved. If we need reproof, reprove us. If we need correction, correct us. If we need comfort, we need edifying. If we need joy, grant it in Christ. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The theme of my messages is Christ, our first love. In our first message, we laid the foundation for this by considering why Christ should be our first love. He loved us. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. He has made us kings and priests, and he is coming again for us. Now, in our second message... We continued this theme showing the glory and the beauty of our first love. We looked with the eyes of faith, I trust, upon the first vision that appears in John's apocalypse. In it, Jesus revealed himself to be the Son of God, the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose of redemption. As true deity, the incarnate God, the Son of man, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, the mighty judge of heaven and earth, and our mediator, prophet, priest, and king. The risen Savior then commanded John to write what he saw and to send it to the seven churches in Asia. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, John faithfully did so. Now, why did the Lord Jesus address these specific churches? Because the commendable works they did and the sinful failings they manifested speak to all Christ's churches throughout the ages. Their strengths and weaknesses expose us, rebuke us, educate us, prepare us, and encourage us. Christ's seven letters are a divine mirror by which we may examine ourselves and examine our congregations. The primary themes of love for Christ and His children, rejection of false teachers, perseverance in trials and persecution, sexual purity, and compromise with the world are vital issue for all God's people in every generation. And it is obvious that it applies to us in this congregation. So first on the list of the letters is the church at Ephesus, from which the theme of my message in this series arises. The title this morning is Leaving Your First Love. May our loving Heavenly Father pour out the power of His Holy Spirit to save the lost, to save the lost. It's been a while since we've seen a conversion. And to sanctify the saved. I thank the Lord for those that are pressing on. But some are clearly backing up. May God have mercy on us. So our first thought is. Jesus Christ commended his people at Ephesus. But rebuked them for leaving their first love. 
That's the idea. That's the theme. Now, Ephesus was the first and greatest metropolis of Asia Minor and one of, the mo- uh, one of the four most powerful cities in the Roman Empire. It wielded great commercial, political, and occult power. Apparently, because of its commercial attraction, political clout, religious prestige, and strategic location, Jesus chose Ephesus as the first city John addressed from Patmos. It was the home of the Temple of Diana, also known as the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it housed an image of the goddess, supposedly fallen from heaven. It also included thousands of priests and priestesses, many of them prostitutes. Now in this dark, demonic stronghold, the Lord Jesus sent the Apostle Paul and others to establish a congregation that would become the headquarters for evangelizing all Asia Minor. Luke wrote, Acts 19.10, All they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, many years before the exalted Christ commanded John to write this letter to the Ephesians, he had inspired the Apostle Paul to write his well-known epistle to the Ephesians, instructing them in doctrine and in the Christian life. He once left Timothy there and wrote two pastoral letters to guide him and to correct and protect the church from the errors of false teachers. His farewell discourse to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 is instructive to elders and teachers today. And it too included solemn warnings about false teachers. Priscilla and Aquila, Apollos and Sosthenes had all taught the Ephesian Christians at various times. And if that were not enough, the Apostle John had spent years among them. Years. How ironic then. How ironic it must have been for John that Christ's first letter was addressed to the church he had ministered to for years. Now, when we read John's letter to the seven churches, we can see that Jesus had a formula for addressing each church. And we will follow that pattern here. Number one, Jesus addressed the angel of the church. The sacred text says, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. And who is the angel of the church? And why are all Christ's letters addressed this way? Well, literally gallons of ink in commentaries has been spent on people trying to give their best interpretation of that. There are three primary views among numerous others, but we do not have time to discuss them. I will not pursue that. But while I am persuaded that the stars represent the elders of the church, whichever view we take does not affect, does not affect the message of each church. Number two, Jesus identified himself by referring to the astonishing vision of his glory in chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. It is why we spent the time. I know for some that was perhaps a little tedious to go through all of those references, but I can tell you, brethren, they are vital to the book of Revelation and they are vital to the letters. Uh, Not the very least because of the fact that Jesus introduces all of the letters but one from that vision. And that is why his introductions carry the weight that they do. These things, Jesus said in his letter, these things 
saith, He that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Jesus identified himself primarily using the images from that first vision. And these first words, these things saith, are found throughout the Old Testament scriptures in the familiar prophetic declaration, thus saith the Lord. This was not suggestion to the church. This was not optional. This was not, well, do you like what I'm saying? Am I offending anybody? You know, try this. This is Almighty God, second person of the Holy Trinity, King of kings, Lord of lords, the Christ of God. And he's saying, listen, this is what I'm saying to you. We might even put it this way. Jesus is saying, here's what I, the Son of Man, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Sovereign Lord. In fact, the Sovereign Lord that governs the universe and your congregation, who holds your elders in my hand and cares for his churches, has to say. We should pay attention. Number three, Jesus knew their works and addressed them. The exalted Son of God, the Lord who has eyes like a flame of fire and a penetrating, omniscient gaze, said to Ephesus, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake labored and hast not fainted. The Greek word translated no, I know thy works, means to comprehend the meaning of something. So the Lord is not merely saying that he had information about the Ephesians and their works. He meant that he understood their lives, their service to him, and the motivations that drove them. Now consider the tender care that Christ shows them. The almighty, perfect Lord. The almighty, perfect Lord. Commended, weak, imperfect believers. For the works he had given them the grace to do. That's truly astonishing. Why in the world would there be any crowns for any of us when any time we get it right, it's been for one reason. Christ has given us the grace to do so. And yet, he rewards his people. This is quite remarkable. This church had learned Christ and the Christian life from the best apostolic teachers. The Ephesian believers detested evil and wicked pagan life and practices. And they had separated from their former lives. They were patient and they persevered in the face of fiery trials. They labored and they toiled to be obedient no matter the cost. And clearly they knew and loved Good doctrine. They would not give an inch to false teachers and they kept heretics out of their pulpit. Paul had taught them to be solid predestinarians, believing that they were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. They believed that Christ had accomplished their redemption through His blood and that they had received forgiveness of sins through the riches 
of His grace. They had heard the word of truth and trusted Christ and believed the gospel of their salvation. They had been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Who would not want to be a member there? But Jesus was ready to shut it down. To take the witness of this church off of the earth. How can that be? Oh, brethren, don't let this be Mount Zion Bible Church. Don't let this be Mount Zion Bible Church. Number four, Jesus evaluated each church, rebuking or commending it. The Son of Man, out of whose mouth came a sword, said these dreadful words, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Who could possibly hear this from the risen God-man and not tremble? Clearly, the Ephesians were blood-bought, eternally loved children of God. What could Jesus have against them? We hear words like this. It begins messing with our theology a little bit. How can the head of the church look at his blood-bought people that he has cleansed? All their sins are wiped away and say, I've got a problem with you. And let me tell you how severe it is. I'm about to shut you down. Where's the grace in that? It's all in Christ. Every bit of it. What could he have against them? He does not make us wait for the answer. The king and the judge of the church solemnly pronounce this stinging sentence. Thou hast left thy first love. Is leaving your first love really that important? I mean, is it like, you know, uh, pornography and drugs and all the stuff that people like to thump the Bible about, abortion. This is the worst for God's people to drift away from the one who hath given them everlasting life, washed away their sins in his blood. All those other things are simply symptoms of hearts detached from God. God's people have been brought into union with him. What is the regenerate soul first love? What should it be? Well, the testimony of Revelation 1 makes it abundantly clear. It can be none other than Christ Jesus. The church is the bride of Christ. For a bride, listen, for a bride to fail in her love for her husband is ultimately to fail in all things. Did Christ not shed his blood for us? Praise his name. He did. Did he not cleanse her from the filth of her sins and lift her out of the dunghill of her sinful life? He did. Did he not make these former pagans to be kings and priests with God? He did. And did he not promise to come again that she might be with him and drink forever of the fountain of life? He did. Yet her love has grown cold. It doesn't seem possible. But it is not only possible it is real and something that probably most Christians at some time in their life, if not often, experience. Oh, again, I urge you, read Octavius Winslow, Personal Declension. Here's a man who knew his own heart and God gave him the mind to articulate it. He didn't read somebody else's book 
and then do a few footnotes and get a book contract. He wrote as a pastor. And it's very pastoral. He knows that the human heart, even regenerate, can become cool and begin to drift. I want every husband in here to imagine this with me. Your dear wife has almost imperceptibly, but you're beginning to notice, grown a little cold, a little distant. She no longer smiles and kisses you when you come in the door after work. She no longer shares your heart with you. She used to want to tell you about her day or she used to want to tell you about what was going on with the children. You're not talking anymore. She speaks little and only when necessary. She no longer warmly embraces him. He knows she does not love him like she used to. He knows. And with that wound in his heart and that growing sense that something has changed, would her, would her industrious house cleaning mean much to him? Her five-star cooking? Her beautiful decorations in the home? It all becomes nothing. Because her love has grown cold and distant. Would he be happy with any of this stuff? No. Because he wants her heart. That's what he wants. He wants her heart. Love is the beating heart of marriage. And love for Christ is the beating heart of the Christian life. What is the greatest commandment from the lips of Christ himself? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Love must be the motive for all that we are and for all that we do for the Christ who loved us first. Oh, my friends, are you and I grieving the heart of our faithful husband? How's, how's your prayer life? And you know, you know what the wrong answer to that question is? Well, I know it could be better. That's the wrong answer. You should say, you know, I'm cold. Um, I actually don't care much about praying right now. Those are honest answers. The other one is a semi-religious answer. Oh, I know what I'd be as a Christian, but somehow it's not quite working out on my schedule. How's, how's your love for the word? We've been so beautifully exhorted by these brothers, and I thank you for your exhortations, brothers. This book, this book, God talks, we talk. Have we grieved our faithful husband? Have we grown cold? Have you left your first love? How is that possible? How is that possible? It's a simple answer. By permitting other loves to displace it. It's simple. By letting other loves Displace it. Sometimes it's kind of like the camel's nose under the tent. 
pretty soon you've got the whole animal in there. This is the way our flesh works. This is the way the world works. And then a mighty fall into sin comes into our lives and we say, how did that happen? As our brother said in the first message, when we're sinning, it started back here. And we permitted something to get in the way of that love that was once kindled in our hearts. The process is simple but its effects are devastating. By the time someone falls into a colossal sin, he or she's been backslidden for a while. Love for Christ has all but extinguished. And that other thing has taken over. Brethren, had not Paul left the legacy of sound doctrine in that church? God's predestinating and electing grace? He did. A successful atonement? He did. The perseverance of the saints? He did. Regeneration and union with Christ? He did. But we can let our love of doctrine replace the love of the one who gave us the doctrine. And we can love our theology and we can love our systems and we can get into our systems so much that they just become kind of our new persona and we look for other people that have the same persona. Not that we love them so much because they love Christ but because they agree with our theology. Jesus' letters are clear. God's people can leave their first love. And don't let your notion of grace distort that image. Because this is the Christ of grace making the accusation. And he knows. Those fiery eyes, that omnipotent Christ knows. Brethren, please don't let that be Mount Zion Bible Church. Five, Jesus gave promises and or declared threats to each. Verse five, having commended and rebuked his loved ones in Ephesus, Jesus then commanded and warned them, remember therefore, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. And do the first works. For from what had they fallen? They no longer had the zealous love for Christ that motivated them in everything they did. And that's a terrible fall for any child of God. Well, what happens when we experience that? One of two things. We prove ourselves reprobate and go back to the world. Or we become theological phonies. We've got our confession. We've got our doctrine. But our hearts are like ice. Paul summarized the Christian life in one sentence to the Galatians. Faith which worketh by love. That's Christianity. We can fill it out, but that's the heart and soul of it. Faith that worketh by love. And now Ephesus had fallen from that essential aspect of the Christian life. What were the Ephesians' first works and how were they different from their present works? Their first works flowed from a genuine love for Christ. But now they had become diligent, orthodox, mechanical, and loveless.
The Ephesians were simply going through the motions, and they were loveless motions. We know where to do it, and so we do it. Not because we love Christ. I would suggest, the text does not say this, but I would suggest they were probably doing precisely the same outward works. But one flowed from a heart of love. The other was just from fleshly habit. With no love for Christ. And this was unacceptable to Jesus Christ. Who loved them. Washed them from their sins in his own blood. Made them kings and priests. And who would come again for them. So the king of the church. Commanded them. Repent. And change your mind about your loveless works. And serve me. Or I will come quickly and remove your candlestick. And once again, this is astonishing. Following this shocking threat. Wait, the Jesus of love threatens his own people? He does. This is a reality. Well, where's the grace? You're squandering it. He's been gracious. As our brother so eloquently ended the last message. There are dangers of refusing the word of God. Even to regenerate souls. But following that, that threat. That awesome warning. Christ surprisingly commended them again. But this thou hast. That thou hatest. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. Or. Some would say the Nicolaitans. He says, which I also hate. Now, there's a word not many people will attach to Jesus. But you know, Jesus is a hater. And he hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And this is a remarkable contrast. They, the Ephesians, hated false teachers and false doctrine. But they left the love of the faithful and true witness. Christ commended their hatred, but rebukes their faded love. Again, Spurgeon says, Love Jesus, and then it is well to hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Love Jesus, and then it is well to hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But mere hate of evil will tend to evil. If love of Jesus be not there to sanctify it. That's right. You know, you know what he's talking about? Those, those groups of us that get with our little bunch. And nobody else is as holy as us. And then we don't fellowship in Christ. Our food, our meat, and our drink is to sit around and talk about how wrong everyone else is. And it becomes an evil itself. The Ephesians had become loveless religious zealots. Haven't you met some Calvinists like that? Maybe some of the meanest people I've ever met were Calvinists. <laughs> the, the only ones worse than those were, were when I worked in the Christian bookstore and some of the crankiest people I ever met were buying a Bible. I mean, man. I would have opted for, you know, drive-through Bible buying back then. Well, following all this comes Christ's crushing words. I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. They would no longer be a witness for Christ. But they've got all this great doctrine. They do all these good things. They seem to be such wonderful people. To have a cold heart to Christ is the opposite of what his gospel and life in him represents.
Don't let this be Mount Zion Bible Church. Number six, Jesus exhorted each member of the, the church to listen. He, singular, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now this is a crucial command and a critical moment in the life of this congregation. Jesus did not address them as a body at this point, but every individual member, everyone here, Every regular attendee and every member has a responsibility to hear this word and obey it. And obey it, not with grit teeth, like your children do sometimes when you tell them to do something, but out of a heart of love for Jesus. Every soul that hath heard the Master has the responsibility to repent and turn again to what? His great love. To have our hearts warmed again in His fire. What's moved into your heart? A nice big ugly grudge that you're nursing? You know, you love those things. That's why you keep them. What's, what's moved into your heart? Well, I don't make I don't like the decisions that the that the elders make, or I don't like what the deacons are doing, or I don't like it. Well, the news family does stuff that we don't do, and I'm, I don't want to even sit in the same pew with them. Well, there are some people we should avoid, but on whose meter? Yours? Or do we have biblically defined sin? Each one of us has a responsibility to keep love for Christ as that which motivates us to serve Him and love His people. Every one of us. This is Paul's command in Ephesians 4. Well, number seven, Jesus especially made promises to the overcomers. Having laid a most solemn threat upon them, Jesus said, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The word overcome means to conquer. Here was a seeming impossibility. In the face of Rome's mighty power, and in conflict with false religions that surrounded them, how would the Ephesians overcome? How would they overcome their cold, waning love for Christ? How would they overcome the pagan world around them? Revelation 12, 11 tells us, tells us, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. The Ephesians could not overcome simply by being orthodox. That's important. I'm not mocking it. They could not simply overcome by busy Christian works. And we have quite an aptitude for pulling all sorts of thing in, things into what we call Christian works and our service to the Lord that maybe sometimes ought to be weeded out. As important as those things are, they would not overcome this way. They and we must overcome. We must conquer by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and the sweet love that comes from Him. When was the last time you thought you had communion with the Lord that was an expression of His sweet love to your soul? Or are these just nice flowery words that people like to throw around? No. 
We overcome by knowing our Christ. And that knowing comes from two simple things. Prayer and the Word of God. <clears throat> now let's make some applications. Number one, <clears throat> we must be careful that our desire for doctrinal purity, which is a good thing, and holy living, a good thing, does not become an idol that leaves us with loveless hearts and a harsh zeal for orthodoxy. Congregations that believe deeply in the authority and sufficiency of Scripture, in the importance of doctrinal and, and confessional purity, in theological conservatism, in separation from worldliness, practicing modesty, reforming manhood, womanhood, and the family, homeschooling, all can easily fall into self-reliance, self-dependency, self-consciousness, and they all work together for self-righteousness. And when we're self-righteous, we're not depending on Christ. We're depending on us and what we're doing. These are all good things. But we are right with God through faith and Jesus Christ. And if we are engaged in these things, it should be for one reason. We find them in the scriptures and out of love for Christ, we pursue them. Spurgeon says, when love dies, orthodox doctrine becomes a corpse. A powerless formalism, adhesion to the truth, sours into bigotry when the sweetness and light of love to Jesus depart. Close quote. Only the love of Christ can kindle our love for him. This is not something we can flog ourselves into or beat ourselves into. You become um, futile you will become very disappointed and discouraged quickly. I'm just going to love Jesus more. It doesn't work. I know. It comes from coming to this book and fixing your mind and your heart on what he says to you. Believing it and walking in it. Number two, while there are many ways that we can lose our first love, many, the easiest way is to neglect one earnest, regular prayer. Oh, you say this all the time. Yes, because I talk to you and, oh, my prayer life's not what it should be. And because the Bible is filled with it from beginning to end. Earnest, regular prayer. Number two, reading and meditating on Scripture. Hearing God and then talking to Him. And three, God-given means of nourishing the soul. God-given means. Sometimes these are called the means of grace. But what God has given to us to nourish our souls careful hearing of and obedience, careful hearing of and obedience to the word preached, biblical use of the ordinances. I mean, what will you take a pass on the Lord's Supper for? Eh, don't need that today. What? Baptism, what's a baptismal service? Uh, you know, that adds, you know, 30 minutes to the meeting. Why don't we scoot? Why would we miss 
the means that God has given us to nourish our soul, when that body goes under the water and comes up, here is one who's proclaiming to the world, proclaiming to you, I've repented of my sins. I am following the Lord Jesus Christ. I am dead to what I was. I am now alive in Christ. Somebody who knows that delights to see that. It feeds their soul. It encourages them in their walk. Why would you cut that out of your life? The taking of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The preaching of the word. Sometimes we put ourselves on too strict a diet, spiritually speaking. Well, now how can we reverse that? Oh, and Christ-centered fellowship. There are people that, you know, just kind of drop into the church, kind of get their message, and then they're gone. This is very unhealthy. Christ-centered fellowship. Now, I'm not just talking about gabbing about what you did last week. That's okay. We do that. But when you're among spiritually-minded people, the things of Christ arise in conversation. And there are things of reproof and rebuke sometimes. In fact, I've had people rebuke me that didn't know they were rebuking me. And I needed it. I heard something, and what they said, like, mm, how did I miss that? Thank you, Lord. You need God's people. If you think you don't, you're probably not one of God's people. So how do we reverse this? Well, uh, number one, we set a specific time every day to meet with the Lord. Now, there will be times when that schedule will be knocked around. But you see, here's what most of us try to do. Here's my life. Oh, here's my list. Here's my stuff. Now, let's see. How can I get Jesus into that? Well, it didn't fit. That's what most of the people I know that profess to be Christians are doing. Instead of saying, I start the day with Christ, with Him, His Word, and then everything flows out from that. Maybe you can't start it. Maybe you have to end the day with Christ, praying for the next day. I'm not going to tell you what your schedule needs to be. But you will never successfully get Jesus jammed into your schedule. You need to go to the head of the church and say, here's my life. What needs to be in it and what needs to be pruned out? And then give me the grace to get cutting. That's another series of messages. But I say to us, dear brethren, there must be a daily dialogue in your house. You with God and God with you. Now, by the way, I do want to say mothers and especially young mothers with lots of little ones running around. They struggle to have time like this. You know what they need? They need a husband that loves them like Christ loves the church and comes in and helps them even after he's had a difficult day and then sits down with the family and feeds her soul with the word of God. Because sometimes mamas run all day long. They need a husband that says, okay, I'm holding three of the children in my lap right now and I'm reading to my wife. Or maybe you need to do something brief with especially little ones, pray with them, catechize them, sing a hymn, put them to bed and then sit down with mama who's too tired to pick the book up. And feed her soul. Number two, when you read the scriptures, take notes and keep a journal of what you're reading. Number three, when you hear the application of a sermon, write it down and then obey. Do what you're hearing 
your pastors, your elders, visiting preachers are saying, thus saith the Lord now. Oh, well, good. The Lord has told me what I need to be doing. Now, that can be abused. I understand that. We're just talking about real honest churches. What should you do? Monday, we often get up and, and I, I, this happens to me. I get up and I go, what, wait, what were my main points yesterday? It can happen to anyone. But that means I need to go back and think about it. I've had to go back to my notes and say, okay, this is, yeah, this is what I was praying. This is what came from the text. Number three, or oh, that is number three. Well, let's, let's get to our last point here. Number three is Christ's prescription, the great physician's prescription for the Ephesians' cold and loveless hearts. That's what we want to think about just for the next few minutes. Our great physician has given his diagnosis. You've left your first love. How does he prescribe the remedy? And how does he describe the, 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 the remedy? Well, Spurgeon points out that there are three R's here. Remember, repent, return. Now, everybody here can remember that. You don't even have to write the notes down. But do that. But you didn't have to. Remember, repent, return. Remember, repent, return. This is what Christ says. Number one, remember, remember from whence thou art fallen. To leave your love of Christ is a grievous sin. This is why he threatens the removal of the church. It is no small thing. How will you remedy your cold heart? How will I remedy mine? Remember Christ's great love for you. Get alone. Stop bowing to the false god of busyness. Enter your Savior's presence. Perhaps we can remember Christ's love this way. It is as if the Father said... My son, I have loved you through all eternity. I love you so that I will give you a bride. And the son replied, And who is that bride, father? She is an idolater. She takes my holy name in vain. She defiles my day of worship. She despises her father and her mother's authority. She murders. She's a fornicator, an idolater, an adulterer. She's a thief. She's a liar. She has a covetous heart. She loves herself. She loves her own way. She loves the lies of the world and she loves her sin. Her heart is a cesspool of rebellion and the home of self-reliance. This is my love gift to you. And the son replies, and how shall I have this love gift from you, Father? You must descend from the glories of heaven. And enter a sin-cursed world that lies in the lap of the wicked one. You must be despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You must keep the law that your bride has broken and bear the fullness of my wrath and my hatred and my fury for her sins. The Jews will despise you and they will reject you. 
And the Gentiles will strip you, and whip you, and beat you, and spit on you, and crucify you, hanging your broken body upon a cross. And men and demons will mock you in your agony. Your bride will cost your life's blood. The hatred of the devil's seed and her own hatred until you have finished the work for her. But you will rise again the third day and you will ascend to glory and sit at my right hand then you will send the Holy Spirit to track her down and to open her heart. And when your spirit reveals her sin and your love for her, she will change her mind about her path to hell and cleave to you with a faith that works by love. And the son said, My father, I love you so that I will with joy humble myself and become a man so that I may be my bride's surety, her substitute, her prophet to show her the way, her priest to offer myself as her sin-bearing sacrifice. And when I return to glory, I will intercede for her every moment of her life. And I will be her king, granting her repentance and faith, for she will have none without my grace. I will govern her in righteousness and protect her from herself and her enemies. I will give her my word so that I may talk to her and I will give her the spirit so that she will talk to me. Our communion will be holy and pure and I will endure the cross and despise the shame to win my bride. Because of my great love for her, she will love me and follow me wherever I lead her. When the time has come, I will return for her and bring her to myself. That we may be together forever. Thank you for this great gift, Father. From this, the Ephesians fell. How about us? Don't let this be Mount Zion. Let's not be cold and mechanical and bound with self-righteousness. Get alone with Christ and his word. Take your concordance and find the passages that speak of Christ's love for you and start memorizing them. And then remember from what you fell. Remember his love. He speaks it daily. Daily. And when you have done this, Number two, repent. Repent of your cold heart. Of your loveless religion. Of your self-reliance. Are you going through the motions of the Christian life? Don't answer that too quickly. Examine yourself by the scriptures. Are you doing what you do? Are you rejecting what you would reject? Because of a love 
for the Christ who gave himself for you. Number three, then return. Return to your place of prayer. Return to your study and your meditation of the word. Return to good works that were fueled by love, which come from that fountain of grace that he pours out to us every day. Only his love for us can kindle our love for him. So brethren, there will be no awakening. There will be no reformation. There will be no revival without love for Christ. Ice cold orthodoxy will not save the day. Our hearts must be ablaze with the revelation of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done to save his people from their sins. May the power of God fall upon us and draw us always to our first love. Amen. Take these truths, Lord, and seal them to our hearts. Lord, some of your children today may have arisen and fellowshiped with thee and their hearts are full of joy and they've come to hear thy word and they've been encouraged. Some may have awoken. Hard as rock, cold as ice. Oh, move in their hearts and draw them to thee. And for those that do not know thee, Lord, which thou seek them out and draw them to thee by thy blessed gospel. In Jesus' holy name, amen. It is time for our lunch break and we will reconvene at 1.45. Uh, Pastor Clarence, would you please thank the Lord for us and for the food? being our sweet provider yet again. We ask that you would bless our time of fellowship, making it fruitful to your glory and to your praise. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Ready for us.